name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, praise to Jesus Christ. This is Timothy S. Flanders. This is The Meaning of Catholic, and I'm joined today by Eric Sammons, Catholic author. Eric, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great. How are you? Excellent. Thanks for coming on. I oh, yeah. Really enjoyed a lot of your commentaries on Taylor Marshall on Twitter, um, a lot of your articles on 1 Peter 5. And uh, so I wanted to chat with you. So um, Eric is the author of uh, The Old Evangelization, Be Watchful, Bitcoin Basics, Holiness for Everyone, Who is Jesus Christ, Unlocking the Mystery of the Gospel of Matthew, and with his wife, The Jesse Tree, um, and, and also a, a number of small eBooks that I just, uh, found a free eBook for myself while I was, uh, before we got on air here. So, uh, Eric, what is your favorite book that you've written? You know, I, I actually think it's my first one, uh, the who is Jesus Christ. Uh, first of all, it's kind of like, you know, the first time you write a book, you never forget that first book you get in the mail from the publisher saying, here you go. And it's just a beautiful thing. But it, it just was a beautiful book for me to write because it was a reflection on scripture, which I love, a re reflection on our Lord, whom I love. And so it was just a great opportunity for me to really reflect on who Jesus is. Because for me, that's always been an important part of my faith. I, you know, I grew up Protestant. And so the Protestants do have a very good ability to focus on Jesus Christ and make him the central part of their faith. And I think that's a good thing. I think Catholics need to do that as well. And so for me, that's always been a, Christology, who Jesus is, has always been very important. And so I think that book is my favorite. It's funny if I, I wrote, it was published 10 years ago. And I think if I wrote today, it would have a lot different feel. But at the same time, I don't think there's anything in there I, that's written that I would that I regret writing or think is wrong or anything like that. I just think I have a different feel for things than I did back then. But I, I still think that's probably my favorite book. That's great. Well, it's good to put something in writing and 10 years later, you don't regret anything. That's good. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's, what, yeah. yeah. Not and the what, same for uh, internet articles. <laughs> here, here's a related question. What do you love about St. Matthew's Gospel? Is that your favorite? Would it you is say? Ab the absolutely my favorite. And Why is that? I think it's because it seems to be the father's favorite, uh, the church father's favorite, that is, uh, in that it's more quoted than any other gospel, especially in the, in the early first 100, 200 years of, of church history. And I, I love its organized fashion of saying, okay, Jews – here is the Messiah. You've been waiting for him. Here he is. And how here I'm going to prove it. And I just love how it's done. It, it, the first couple chapters, it gives a lot of the uh, arguments of, from scripture, Old Testament scripture, why Jesus fulfills the requirements of the Messiah. And it goes through and proves who he is. And so I, that's why I've always really liked Matthew. Also being the first gospel written I think it has a certain precedence in obviously not saying the other ones aren't inspired or great or anything like that, but it has a certain precedence and the church has always seen it like that as kind of the first gospel, the first one that really made the proclamation that Jesus is Lord, that he is the promised Messiah, that he's a fulfillment of the entire old Testament. So I think that's why I, I really think of Matthew as my, my favorite personal favorite gospel. That's great. Yeah. There's a lot of great stuff in Matthew. I'm thinking, you know, obviously the sermon on the Mount, the sheep and the goats, um, the, in the, the interaction with St. John the Baptist when he's, right. uh, I, I, I love that scene in particular in Matthew. Um, so, and then be, I, I don't want to forget to mention your new book. Can you tell us about your new book? The one that's coming on? out, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the one I'm working on, the working title is Deadly Indifference, How Religious Relativism Has Wrecked the Catholic Parish. And the basic, you should feel, figure out the thesis from the title. But we know that if you look at the average life of a Catholic parish in America in 1900, 
versus, or let's say 1920 versus 2020, it's radically different. Everything about it's different. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And I don't want to be somebody who claims there's only one reason. But I would say a major factor has been the rise of re religious relativism and differentism in the church over the past 50 years. The idea that it doesn't really matter if you're Catholic. It doesn't really matter what religion you are. All roads lead to heaven, so to speak. That has kind of undercut the whole purpose of the parish. I, after all, the purpose of a parish is to lead souls to heaven. And if you can still get to heaven by sleeping in or going down to the Protestant church, going to the synagogue or going to the mosque, doing nothing, what's the purpose of the parish? It becomes a social club where the purpose is to have sports teams, to have some social gatherings, to have some book clubs, things like that. And I think that's, that's a real problem in the church. And so I'm trying to really take the, the kind of high level church theory of other teaching on other religions, but also how it's been practiced by church leaders and by many Catholics and bring it down to the level of the average Catholic who just experiences it in the pew. How is it different for the average Catholic who walks into a parish in 1920 versus walking into a parish in 2020? That's, that's a very needed topic, of course. And that's, that's going to be mainly about the American church. Yes. I'm going to focus. There's a good, probably be a little bit, maybe England, Western Europe, things like that, but it's really going to be focused on America because to be honest, that's what I know. And that's, that's what I, that's, it's also what's easiest to, uh, to examine and to research because right. there's just much more data on it than on any other church. And do you see much of this relativism before Vatican II? No, not at all. But you do see, I mean, you, you start seeing changes. The changes accelerate in the 60s, but you do start seeing parts of it before that. In fact, when I was a uh, student, a grad student in theology at uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville, I did a paper on Catholic ecumenism before Vatican II. And some people would say, well, that's like, you know, a blank piece of paper, right? <laughs> but it's not. I mean, there really was a development in how the church looked at ecumenical relations and interreligious dialogue during that time. You see there is a difference between, for example, how it was seen in the 1900s, uh, I'm sorry, the 1800s and the 1900s. But for the average Catholic in the parish, it didn't really trickle down to them. It didn't really start impacting them until the 1960s and 70s. So even though the church start, started to slowly and hesitantly embrace ecumenical work before Vatican II, for your typical Catholic on the street, he still believed, I need to be Catholic or I'm going to hell. Whereas by the 60s and 70s, that belief disintegrated and it became more true, just like, well, being Catholic is what I do. And Mr. Jones down the street being Protestant is what he does. And we'll just kind of leave each other alone. I really like that the perspective that you're taking in terms of the average Joe in the pew, because it's easy when we look at history to think about this thinker doing this or that thinker in this political situation. But the, the mass of people are just, you know, just random people working plumbers, electricians or whatever. And I really like you taking that perspective to see what is the sort of this cultural revolution going on right. that really impacts people. Um, it reminds me, you have this great article called The New Papalators, and I hope we'll get into that later. But I wanted to ask you about um, your, your upbringing, your conversion to Catholicism. So you grew up some kind of Protestant. What, what yes. kind of Protestant were you? Tell us about that. Okay, so I grew up United Methodist. I was a member of United Methodist Church. My parents were, and I, I was as well. I was very involved. Well, I should say I got very involved in high school. I had a conversion experience where I gave my life to Jesus Christ, accepting as my personal Lord and Savior, as, as we would say back then. And I do believe that was a grace-filled moment. That was my sophomore year of high school. Uh, I think it was a very emotional moment. I think you, you can't really separate that. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit did work through my emotions, through that event, to change my, the direction of my life. Because before that, I had been starting to go down a, a path that wasn't a good one, uh, going to parties with alcohol and things like that. And then this really sent me in a whole different direction. And so I became very uh, active in my, in my Protestant church and my faith in, in high school. 
fact, my nickname with some of my friends was Joe Bible Stud, <laughs> which was done half mockingly and half just good naturedly. And so I got very involved with that. And so when I went off to college, I got involved with Campus Crusade, Crusade for Christ, which I think it's called just uh, Crew now because they, they thought Crusade sounded politically incorrect. I think. Like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's what it was when I went to yeah. college, too. And so it, it was it, it was a evangelical uh, Protestant para church organization uh-huh. and uh, and non-denominational things like that. But what happened was, is I got involved in the pro-life group in college and that was really what set me down the path to catholicism was i was now interacting with catholics it's one thing i don't know if people catholics always realize is that when i was in high school for example i was very active in my faith i I was trying to learn as much as i could about christianity but i knew nothing about catholicism and i didn't even realize there was that much of a difference between the two for me it was just another denomination a little bit odd because they would go to church on saturday nights sometimes instead of sunday morning But that was like the extent of it. And so I didn't have these anti-Catholic beliefs or thoughts, but I didn't have any pro-Catholic. I was just like, whatever. It didn't really matter to me. So it wasn't until college when I really started interacting with practicing Catholics that I heard realize, oh, hold on. This is a a whole different animal than the differences between Methodism and Presbyterianism and just non-denominationalism and all the Baptists and all the different uh, denom- Protestant denominations. So, but that's kind of who I was. I was. So I was very active in my faith. I was a strong evangelical Protestant, took it very seriously, uh, but didn't really have any connection to or interest in Catholicism. So you, you, you met some Catholics for the first time. And, and so what, what was that? when you were first attracted to the faith? Yeah. So what happened was I started getting very involved with the pro-life group and it was of the active members. I was about the only Protestant. It was a bunch of Catholics. And so we would go to, this is the early nineties. We would go to uh, the abortion clinic to pray and they would all get out their rosaries, pray the rosary. And I would just stand there and do my Protestant thing. Sometimes maybe bring a Bible with me or something like that. And so I, what, what happened was I started seeing, Catholics, like the Catholics I knew in high school, they, yeah, they said they were Catholic, but they didn't really practice their faith at all. So for me, I had no experience of Catholics being good Christians, as I would call it at the time. And so now all of a sudden I started seeing Catholics who were actually practicing Christians. And so that really started to open up. It was kind of like this process of opening up my eyes to say, okay, well, Catholics can be Christian. They can be good Christians as well, just like in a denomination is what I thought at the time. And so as I started though, to get to know them, I, I became roommates with a couple of Catholics, my sophomore year of, of college. And so, you know how it is in college, you spend late nights talking about things like philosophy and theology and religion, life, all that stuff. And so I would, I started to realize, wow, there are some real fundamental differences between what Catholics believe and what Protestants believe. And I was very blessed that the people the Catholics I was hanging out with knew their faith. They knew how to defend it. They knew the differences. Uh, at that, I remember one of my friends, he subscribed to This Rock Magazine, which was the, what's now called Catholic Answers Magazine. So he knew apologetical arguments, which I, you know, I praise God for that, because he was able to explain to me what Catholics really believe. And of course, I say this in a very antiseptic way, but you know, as a 20-year-old or whatever it was in college, he and I would be screaming at each other sometimes in these debates, just about, you know, how he was, he, the Pope, you know, wasn't infallible, I would yeah, you know, say, it would get really heated. But it was all done with respect. We were good friends. We were, we were best friends. And so it was just done uh, in that kind of immature college way, I guess you yeah. could say. And so that really started the process where, you know, at first, I, I'm trying to remember, there was something, I can't remember what it was. I think it was praying to saints was the first uniquely Catholic belief that I said, you know, that actually makes sense that it makes sense that when you die, if you are a believer, that you are not all of a sudden separated from the believers on earth, that there is some connection still. And that sure enough, if I'm going to ask my roommate to pray for me, why wouldn't I ask a saint in heaven to pray for me? And so that, 
that was the first one that really made sense to me. But it, at that point, it was still a matter of, you know, a broken watch is right twice a day. So it's not that big a deal. But the dominoes started to fall at that point. And I started to realize more and more that, wow, they're right on this. They're right on that. They're right. You know, and it kept on going over and over again. And then, but what happens is, and you're a convert, right? Yes. Okay. So you kind of know the process a little bit where you intellectually can accept something, but that's a whole different animal from accepting and changing your religion because there's so many consequences to changing a religion from mentally, spiritually, psychologically, socially, you can potentially lose all your friends, your family might reject you. All these things go through your mind consciously and subconsciously. And so I got to the point where I had essentially accepted Catholicism intellectually, but did not have any desire whatsoever to convert. Like I remember my sister, my older sister who went to college with me, she was also a good practicing Christian. She saw me hang out with all these Catholics and she was like, you're not going to become Catholic, are you? And I said, no, absolutely not. And literally a month later, I decided to convert. <laughs> and I, I've, I've tried to, I've told my sister since then, I was not deceiving you. I was very sincere when I said what I said, but the Holy Spirit works as the Holy Spirit works. And so, and it really was the blessed mother that I just had a moment about a month after I told her that. And after I told my, my best friend, Catholic friend that don't try to convert me, I'm not going to convert. I, you know, the, I, I believe the blessed mother really worked in my life to bring about a conversion that happened actually very quickly. Once it was a Friday, I thought maybe I should become Catholic. And it was the next Tuesday that I decided for sure to convert. So <laughs> it was just an amazing thing where it took years to get yeah, to intellectually. It sounds like Mary was involved with that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a funny thing because I decided to pray the rosary. And when I told my Catholic friend I was going to pray the rosary for a week just to see what happens, he, he, the first thing he said was, dude, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, you leave rosaries out for me to pray. And now you're telling me not to. He's like, well, I'm just telling you, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> and I was, and, and of course he was right. And of course he wanted me to pray, but he just wanted to warn me that it, it can be life changing. So if you're not ready for yeah. it, you might want to slow down. And so sure enough, I prayed it for a couple of days and said, okay, I'm in. And so it just, it's a great thing because it can't, for me, at least it shows both the intellectual and the spiritual side of it. Intellectually, it, it took me years to kind of finally grasp Catholicism, but then the spiritual was just an act of grace. It, I believe it was just an act of grace to, to, to switch on the light, so to speak, and say, yeah, this is the true faith. This is the faith that I, I, I want to live. Yeah, I love that. Uh, just when Mary gets involved, especially with somebody's praying the rosary and they're not Catholic, it's just like, nah, it's all the amount of time. So That's right. um, here's, a, here's an intellectual question for your, your conversion. Being a lover of scripture and reading scripture, how did you get past sola scriptura? Yeah, so for me, I, I think it was a matter of, I just simply saw the argument made sense to me that when I studied how we got the Bible, I honestly believed I had a very almost uh, Islamic form, if you say, of yeah. scripture in the sense that Islam believes that essentially the Quran was dropped out of heaven and given to Muhammad or, or a Mormon form where the Book of Mormon, which is given to Joseph Smith. Right. I had that belief of the, oh, of the Holy Scriptures I'm not saying it was taught to me by my pastors and things like that. It just simply was, that was kind of the assumption. It wasn't taught to me how we got it. And so I just kind of assumed that it just came from heaven in, in, in its current form. And it just somehow we all knew it was the Holy Bible. And once I started realizing how we got it, that it actually was a 400 year process to fit, well, first of all, it's almost a, probably a 30 to 50 year process to write it. And then it was a 400 year, almost 400 year process to decide, okay, which books are actually scripture and which are not. And how that decision was made, it was based primarily upon what was read in the liturgy. All those things made me realize, hold on a second. If it, if we, if it takes these Catholic bishops and Catholic councils to say, to determine what the table of contents of the Bible is, well, then it seems a bit odd to say, 
okay, but the Bible itself, I don't need those same councils and that same church to, to interpret what it means. And the other th point, so that's on one direction was the history, but the other was very practical. I got sick and tired of Protestant theological debates. I still remember having a debate with a friend. He was another member of Kent's Crusade for Christ, evangelical Protestant Christian. I, you know, completely committed. I was like, this guy is definitely Christian. And I found out he was never baptized and he had no desire to be baptized Whoa. because he, he just said, well, it's just a symbol. It's just now something that's you crazy. do. <laughs> I know. Instead, that's even was, rare for Protestants. For I, it is. Absolutely is. But here's the thing. My Protestant friends, nobody was really scandalized by it but me. And I, I just like, wait a second. If we are having debates on these fundamental issues of Christianity, like whether or not you need to be baptized, then Sola Scriptura is a dead letter at best. If you can't, I mean, I, I, of course, you and I both know the, the great debates we have in Catholicism, but we're talking about essential points of doctrine, about whether or not you should be baptized. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's essential to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, a big moment for me as well, where I realized, okay, it's just not working. Solo scripture is, is not working. If my buddy hasn't even been baptized and no, nobody seems to be, have a problem with it, that, that's, just, that's just crazy. We, we need some other, we need something to tell us why he's wrong and I'm right or vice versa even. We need somebody, I need somebody to tell me that I can trust. And so eventually, right. of course, I realized it's the church, is the Catholic church is who I, I can trust to tell me whether or not we need to be baptized. Yeah, it's just remarkable once you have that one aha move moment with, I think, and I, at least intellectually speaking, it's like the entire Protestant, every Protestant group is based on this one idea, basically. And it just takes a little bit of history and then it just all collapses. All falls apart. Yeah. So, uh, excellent. So, okay. So you're, you're in college now. Are you at Steuben? You're not at Steuben. No, Walmart. this is a public is university in okay. Denton, Ohio. Yeah. So you're, okay. So you're in Denton, Ohio. And what's your undergraduate degree? It's it, Miami, Miami University of Ohio. Or, Miami. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, systems analysis, computers, basically. Okay. Yeah. And so I was studying computers and uh, I was just enjoyed that. And I was, I was got very involved with pro-life movement, so much so that after graduation, I joined a pro-life group full-time, a full-time uh, activist, college uh, pro-life activist group. And so we would go and pray at abortion clinics. We would, and this was during the height of Operation Rescue when people were sitting in front of clinics and getting arrested and things like that. And so I joined one of those groups uh, full-time for a little while. And then, and then I went off to uh, get my master's degree at Steubenville. So, Excellent. but I become okay. Catholic my senior year. In my senior year of, um, of college, I actually was received into the church, I should say. And then I, it was just a few months later, I actually went out to Denver for World Youth Day with uh, John Paul II. And that was a big deal because oh, okay. all of a sudden I really saw in real life the universalism of the church. I had okay. grown up in the Midwest town in a small United Methodist church, had very low exposure to global Christianity. And all of a sudden now I see it flowering in front of me. And so that was a, that was a big deal for me as well. But then soon after that, I went off to... Uh, to Steubenville. That's when I went to Steubenville to get my master's degree in theology. Okay. So your master's, uh, is that like M-A-T or something? Is there, yeah, it, it, the... it, Master's of Arts in Theology. Okay. So Master's of Arts in Theology at Steubenville, mm -hmm. the Franciscan University. And how did that experience influence the whole journey? Well, that was interesting because I, I'm very, I, it's very, it's kind of convoluted my life story, but essentially I went to Steubenville for a year and a half left before I finished because of getting married, did not want to get a rack up college debt. Then 15 years later, I finished the degree through an online, through their online program, finished up the last few classes I need to get my actual degree. So I didn't actually get my degree until 17 years later. But that year and a half I was there was huge for me because I was able to really dive deep into Catholic theology in, on a level that I had not seen before. So when I became Catholic, it was mostly through Catholic apologetics. So Catholic answers, things like that, which are great, but they're very much just the, the basics. Now, all of a sudden, I started reading a lot of theology. And at Steubenville, especially at the time, the emphasis is very much on 20th century Catholic theology. So I was reading De Lubac, Daniel Liu, uh, Ratzinger, 
JP2, people like that. All, all the ones who are, you know, we didn't read the explicit heretics or anything like, oh, oh, we'd read them to critique them. We didn't support that. But I very much embrace that view of Catholicism, uh, the new theology. I always forget how to say the uh, French term for it. Uh, Nouvelle theology. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> can, can you sum up what that, what is that view that you're, could you just sum that up in like two sentences? How would you describe that? Probably like not, but I will try. Um, <laughs> I would say it essentially is, the idea is a return to the sources that we want to get rid of kind of the accretions uh, that have built up over time in the church and get back to the fundamental Catholicism that was found in scripture and in the early church. That's the ideal and that's the desire. And I, at the time, thought that makes sense. And that might have appealed, frankly, now that I look back on it, frankly, to my Protestant upbringing, because Protestants always feel like they're going back to the original primitive Christianity. And this had a a hint of that in it. And so I think that's why it attracted me. And there's a lot that I could say good about it, but I I did come to, which I can talk about later, come to the conclusion there was a lot of flaws in it as well. But the point is, is I I really got deep into that. I mean, I, it was, I mean, I can't even believe now that I'm, you know, 20 years, 25 years later, how crazy it was, how much I was deep into this theology reading it. I mean, I remember reading, a 900 page deep theology text in like two days or something like that. Because I mean, you're just in school. You're just, and I, my wife will tell you, I made no friends. She was, I was engaged to her at the time. I made no friends at all while I was there. I I went to school with some other people who are well known now and they probably have no idea I was even there because I literally spent my entire time in the library or in my apartment reading theology. And my wife will, you know, like I said, we were engaged. She was living in the same town. I didn't see her very much either. <laughs> I was just nerding it up completely. And, but it was great because what it did was it gave me a foundation in a lot of, of just more than just kind of your surface apologetics, a really deep theology, had me reading the church fathers, reading scripture more, reading these thoughts of, of people like somebody like Ratzinger, who Ratzinger was always my favorite when he became Pope. I mean, I seriously almost had an aneurysm. I was so excited. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, it, it, but that's, and I would say that therefore I became a JP2 Catholic and I had a, I was never a charismatic Catholic, but that was my influence as well because Steubenville at the time had a much stronger influence of charismatic Catholicism. The people who were Catholics who brought me into the church, they were associated with char- uh, charismatic Catholicism. And so, whereas I never really, my personality is just very reserved. I just can't, you know, do the whole put your hands up and all that stuff. But I was very much uh, a part of that in a sense that that was kind of my outlook on things. And I was very much would call myself a JP2 Catholic. And that's really what I was for the next 15, I guess, 15 years. I got very involved with... uh, with um, my parish evangelization, doing evangelization. I mean, we actually went door to door with various, uh, door to door for our parish and promoting the Catholic faith and things like that. And I got very involved in just different uh, evangelization works as a Catholic. And that's really what I did for the next, I mean, I was married and had a kids and worked, but that's what I did on the side, so to speak, was all of that before I finally came, went back, finished my degree about 10 years ago. Okay, so this the Steubenville Nouvelle Telegy JP two Ratzinger um, gives you this foundation. You're working as an evangelist. So when does the trad experience come in? So I, I after right after I got my degree in uh, master's degree in theology, I got a job as the director of evangelization for a diocese in a diocese in Florida. And so I we I moved my family there and. When I got there, my experience was we, we picked a good parish in when we, where we lived before, a good Nova Sordo parish, and we, we liked it and everything. When I got down there, none of the parishes nearby I felt were even acceptable on the level for my kids to go to. I mean, I wanted them to go. My ideal at that time was the Nova Sordo parish that was orthodox, preach the faith, things like that. But things like altar girls, the liturgy, all that stuff. 
I didn't, I didn't really support like altar girls, but I didn't really care that much either. And so there was a Latin mass parish, a fraternity of St. Peter parish that was in the area. So we started going to that simply because it was the only one that we felt was one that we could bring our kids up in that they wouldn't potentially be uh, exposed to just the full on modernism. And so that's an interesting situation where all of a sudden at the same time, I'm working for a diocese and I'm now going to a Latin mass parish. And those two things started to be really kind of sent me different signals because working for a diocese, and I don't have any better way to put it, but I really saw the inside of the belly of the beast. <laughs> and it's not even like I was in a bad diocese. I'm not trying to diss on the people I worked with or even the bishop I worked for. It's more the reality of what it means to be a diocese and a parish today and Catholic today is what I saw. And in fact, the fact that our diocese wasn't a bad diocese speaks more volumes to me that I'm not talking about I went to somewhere like Milwaukee under Weekland or something like that, where of course it's terrible. I went to a diocese that actually had a relatively orthodox bishop and all that. But I just saw that I would do all this work for evangelization that would send them to a parish that would not be Catholicism. It was watered down. It was a, a, just, I mean, it was just awful. And I felt like I, I couldn't send them to where I needed to send them to, which was to the priest, to the parish, because when they went there, they would not get Catholicism. And then at the same time this is happening, I'm seeing the, the faith lived out and preached and practiced at my Latin mass parish. And the dichotomy just kept getting stronger and stronger in my mind. I would travel because part of my job was going to all these different parishes, speaking about the faith, giving talks, uh, helping them with evangelization, stuff like that. And it was just, it was a very frustrating experience because I just, could, I felt like I was running on about 30% of what I could really do because there's just so much you can't, do you can't say well i think one thing that would probably help would maybe that the priest should turn around during mass and, and be ad orientum or something like that there's no way you could suggest that because if you do you just get rejected immediately and nobody's going to listen to you when you say that but i realize things like that matter and so that really was a a, a about a five-year process of that happening and the funny thing is that I never went into it. I didn't want to be a Latin mass person. I didn't want to be a trad. In fact, I had, I, I probably could be talking about things you're, you regret writing later. I had a blog back then, which is, was shut down years ago after I took the job. And I remember writing things why, like why the Novus Ordo mass is great or something, you know, things like that, which now I just look at and be like, oh my gosh. And I'd have things railing on rad trads and things of that nature. And now I look back on it, I was like, you know, I, I was looking more at the surface of a traditionalist who maybe wasn't very charitable in his actions, but underneath what he was saying was actually right. And so that was this whole process. Then we moved, I, I left the job, but I, so all this had been percolating. And I will say that, so I'm already that direction. I'm already embracing a lot of traditionalism, but I think the moment when I decided to kind of go public, my coming out <laughs> was McCarrick was when the Carrick uh, scandal broke in 2018. Oh, okay. I'd, yeah, I had lived in D.C. for 10 years, and part of that was under McCarrick. It was when McCarrick was there and Whirl came. And I just knew, we knew at the time something was wrong with McCarrick, but we didn't. Nobody wanted to come out publicly and say it. And I was just some average Joe Catholic at the time. It's not like I had some instant information. But I just, you just knew that, something was wrong there. And when that came out and just the, the, the enormity of it, of the, how much had been hidden, how so many people at such high levels had covered up for him and allowed him to continue to abuse and to do these awful things and how the Pope himself had, had brought him back into the life of the church after Benedict had quietly uh, sidelined him. I just realized all these traditionalists that I don't want to say I'm part of, even though I agree with them on a lot of the liturgy and things like that. I realized they've been right all the time. And yeah, sometimes they can be jerks and they can be 
uh, abrasive and all these things, but you know, everybody's a sinner and we, all, every group has its, its uh, sins that it falls into, but ultimately they were right. They were right. They were right. They were right. And I just realized, you know, I'm tired of just acting like, or actually I should say, I'm tired of being high and mighty and looking down on these traditionalists like, oh, look at the, those, those traditionalists. I'm glad I'm not like them, that they, they're always complaining about things in the church and they're always saying everything's bad. It was kind of this eye-opening moment. I mean, the funny thing, I've been writing for 1 Peter 5 for three years before this, so it's not like I was anti-trad at that point, but it was more of a matter of saying, I'm willing to just say publicly, yeah, the Latin Mass is the way to go. I'm a traditional Catholic. And if you don't like that, I don't really care anymore because look how bad things are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right on. I want to ask you, Eric. Um, so what you're saying is you're, so you're kind of just, again, sort of practically speaking. And I, and I love what you're saying in terms of the evangelism, because um, I was a part of St. Paul street evangelization. Oh yeah. Um, and great organization. I love, mm -hmm. I love them. Um, yep. But, and yeah, but the, but the issue comes when, I mean, if you convert a bunch of people out the street and you send them to your average parish, yep. uh, I, I remember actually my wife, when she wanted to become Catholic, she was at the cathedral and they have a Catholic information center at our cathedral. And the priest there said, you don't need to become Catholic. Right. So that type of thing is going to happen. Right. So, um, and you, you're not going to really get that uh, continuance of your hard, hard work catching you know, the f fishing for men, you know? So, uh, yeah, I want to ask you about the reform of the reform hermeneutic of continuity, which basically says that the whole problem in the church is because the Vatican II reforms were not implemented properly and the documents are fine, but they were just misinterpreted and, you know, Ratzinger says there's the council of the media and the council of the fathers and all this. So how did you come to a conclusion that that wasn't really adding up? Right. So I embraced that fully for a very long time. I was very much a Ratzingerian, whatever you want to call that very much reform of the reform. I was happy in 2007, even though I had no desire to go to Latin mass myself, I was happy when he liberalized the, the saying of the Latin mass, but I felt like that could influence the Novus Ordo in good ways. And so all that I was, I embraced fully. But what happened was, is as I, I looked more into it and I saw the reality of what the Novus Ordo Mass is in reality. And the way I saw that was being exposed to a lot more parishes than the one I decided to go to. I think sometimes for conservative JP2 Catholics, they go to a good, quote unquote, good Novus Ordo parish. And they don't really, where the, the priest does a, a, a good job of never preaching heresy, of being reverent during his mass and all of those things. And so for them, it's it just, that's the reality. It's not that bad, I guess you, the way you put it. But I, because of working for diocese, I went to every parish in the diocese. I would go to mass before I, you know, maybe give a talk, go to mass first or daily mass or Sunday mass sometimes, whatever. And so I, started, I saw, and of course in traveling and everything, I saw that the reality is the vast, vast majority of your parishes, the, the mass they celebrate is not something that is uh, reverent. It does not honor God in the way it should. I never thought that it wasn't valid or anything. I still don't think that, but I, I never, I felt like it doesn't really honor the Lord the way it should. And Concurrent to all this, I had gone for a while semi-regularly to an Eastern Catholic divine liturgy, like maybe a few times a year, I'd always make sure I go. And that was my first exposure to reverent liturgy, truly reverent liturgy. It wasn't the Latin mass, it was Eastern Catholic. And so I knew out there, there was like, it was like, you know, it's one of these things where it takes a long time, maybe I'm just slow to really percolate what it means, but I, I knew there's these reverent liturgy out there. I went to a couple Latin masses and I was like, that seems different. And then of course, when I started going regularly to Latin mass, I just saw that there is another option out here that has existed for a long time. That is all the things that we say the, the Novus Ordo should be to do a good job. It all exists there already. And so 
that seemed to be a problem. But then when I started to really look at how Vatican II and the, the, the new mass was implemented and things like that, it really just seems so divergent from how the church had always worked in the past with the mass and with the liturgy. And so I had always embraced the whole idea of it's, it's the implementation that's the problem, not the council. But the more I study the council, and I, I, should, I have it in this room, I can't grab it right now, but I have the, the documents of Vatican II. People say, oh, you need to read the documents. I took a graduate level course on Vatican II. We had to study all the documents, write papers on them. I've been reading them for 25 more plus years. My, my copy of it's all beat up and marked up and everything like that. But the more I say it, the more I realize it has ambiguity in there, in the documents. And when I saw how, when I read the, 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 how the council fathers voted and how they, all this came to being, I realized it has deliberate ambiguity in there. And so for me, I thought, okay, first of all, that's a problem. But then I also thought the whole argument of the implementation is the problem. I think that's a problematic argument because who implemented the council? The exact same bishops who were at the council, they all either implemented or accepted it. And so if you try to, if the, if the JP2 Catholic wants to say the implementation's a problem, I'm going to say to you, well, why, what gives you the right to criticize the implementation when the implementation was done by the people who approved the documents themselves? And so obviously they felt like it was consistent with the documents in some way. Why, what gives you the right to say that they were wrong? And so for me, that's, that's an argument saying that the documents themselves have issues. And I would not be, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, accept the idea that they have heresy in them, but I do accept the idea. And in fact, I believe strongly they have, they do have ambiguity that allows these these problematic elements. And then you add to the fact that the Novus so the, the Novus Ordo, the way it was implemented, is really problematic because the liturgy. Sometimes you'll get arguments against trads will say, "Oh, you you think the liturgy static? Don't you realize it's changed over the centuries?" The difference is, is that the liturgy, when it changes, it always changes slowly and organically. Whereas at, after Vatican II, the liturgy changed quickly and bureaucratically. It was done by committee. In this hodgepodge, let's just grab things we think we like from church history, throw them all together and say, okay, this is, this is the new liturgy. And so all of those things made me realize the reform of the reform is a failed experiment. And it really doesn't work. And, and Again, I'll go back to the McCarrick scandal. There was something about it that made me say, this is the culmination of the, the post-Vatican II church. This is a real reflection of it. And it's amazing how many people I have talked to who have come to a similar conclusion. Uh, at our parish, we started having many more people come to the Latin Mass. I've heard from people online and people contacting me saying they started going to, Latin mass regularly after McCarrick scandal broke because they realized, as my pastor put it, we need to bring out the big guns. Now this fight we're in is much more diabolical than we ever imagined. We need to bring out the big guns and the big guns are these traditional prayers, the traditional liturgies, the traditional rituals of the church, things like the, the ritual of baptism where you're, you're doing the exorcisms the, 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 the ritual of confirmation where, you know, the, the, the bishop smack in the cheek of the, of the kid and things like that, all these things, those are the big guns we've been, we've had for so long and were taken away. We need to bring them back. And so that's why I think the reform of the form is, is just not going to work. So how do you, I, I, what I observe is that there, there is a strong reluctance to admit that, Vatican II, as a magisterial act, as an ecumenical council, which we accept as an ecumenical council, had some kind of flaw or deficiency in itself. Because <clears throat> I think that the, the conservative or the sede, they both sort of assume that there must be sort of some sort of uh, perfect character or inerrant character in some sense of this magisterial act. So therefore, the Sedai says, well, there's error or there's deficiency. So therefore, 
we're in a set of Vicante. Whereas the conservative says, well, there, there cannot be any error. It's impossible. So the problem has to be with the implementation. But you're basically asserting that there is some, like, how do you uh, reconcile that with, you know, the gates of hell do not prevail. And, you know, it is a magisterial act. How do you, how do you reconcile that? I would say it's, honestly, it's, uh, I would say, I would, let me paraphrase Cardinal Newman. To be deep in history is cease to be a JP2 Catholic or a SETI. <laughs> oh that's a beautiful answer i love it and so really it is a it is a deep study of history that seeing that we've had councils that were failed councils the council of florence for example the whole purpose of it was to reunite the east and the west it failed miserably in that task i mean that's just a reality yes everybody thought it succeeded as soon as you know with all the votes that the eastern hierarchs that were there and stuff like that but ultimately did it happen no it didn't happen and other councils that were, uh, which Lateran was it the one right after, right in the beginning of the 16th century? Yeah, five. Lateran five. Man. Five, thank you. What did that do? Nothing. And so we see in history that councils, they don't have some protection that they're going to be effective, that they're going to be uh, well written or anything like that. For me, the, the argument that the, the, our Lord's words at the gate to hell will not prevail to the church. For me, what that means, and I believe this is a very a Catholic way of looking at it, of course, or I wouldn't accept it, is that the church will always preach the gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ in its fullness. And that it will never preach in a dogmatic way something that takes away from or is contrary to that gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, but that doesn't mean that the people in the church won't do a terrible job of living it. It doesn't even mean that we'll do a good job of preaching it. We might do a terrible job of preaching it, but we won't preach error in the sense in, in an official way. And so, for example, when a council document is written, what will not happen is it will not declare something as dogma, as doctrine, that, is, that, it, that contains error. It just cannot do that. That's the protection of the Holy Spirit right there. But it might, it might have uh, poorly worded uh, phrases that can be interpreted in a heretical way. It might dive into areas of outside of faith and morals, such as, as economics, in which it does err. There's no protection of the, of the church that it won't, won't err in something uh, like the sciences or something like that. And so those things are not protected from the, 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 um, the, by, by the Holy Spirit. And so I would say the Ecumenical Council of Vatican II, and again, it's a legitimate Ecumenical Council. There's, no, there's nothing anti-Catholic or against Catholic faith to say that it, it could just simply be a failed council, that the intention of the council, which was to bring more people into the church. The stated intention was to uh, make it so that the church was more attractive to the modern world so that more people would become Catholic. I mean, the reality is it is a failed council. I don't know how, I mean, just look at the numbers. The fact is what they wanted to do did not happen. And so therefore it is a failed council. And so what do we do with that? Do we simply just keep on keeping on and hope for the best and act like nothing's wrong? Or do we own up to our mistakes and say, we need a, a different path than the one we've been taking since the early 1960s. And I would argue we need a different path. And I know some people might say, oh, well, you're traditionalist. You just want to go back. You just want to go back to 1950s. No, that's not true. What I want to do though, is do a reboot, so to speak, where most of the innovations that came from Vatican II are scrapped. And then we start anew and we do adapt to the modern world, but in a way that is much more consistent with our tradition, much more consistent with the teachings that our fathers in the faith had before us. I think that's, that's the path forward, but it's not, it's not the path of Vatican II. So, and how does uh, papalatry fit into this, if that's the way to say it? Right, and so papalatry, as I define it, is basically this idea, it, it's a, it's, it's not meant to be taken literally in the sense that you idolize a Pope as God, but what it does, although I think some in practical purposes almost do that, what it really means is that you, you 
so exalted the office of the papacy that you take anything a pope says or does and you believe it must be accepted without criticism and accepted blindly. And this would extend to everything a pope does from papal encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, to interviews on an airplane, to comments he makes to an interviewer that's where the notes aren't taken down. I mean, everything you have to, as a good Catholic, you have to basically accept that, give the obedience of faith to that. And I believe that's heresy. And I believe that's very strongly been clearly heresy in the, in the history of the church that the Pope, his, his primary role is as the steward. He's not the King. He's a steward of the, of the faith who makes sure that what we have been handed, what has been handed on to us continues to be handed on to the next generation. That's his primary purpose. It's not to innovate. It's not to create new doctrines or anything like that, new beliefs, new practices, new disciplines, but it's simply to say, okay, we've received this. We need to pass it on. Yes, there will be adaptations over time, but the, again, those are slow and organic. So for example, I've said this example before, but for example, the, in, in, a, in a space of a hundred years, you might add St. Joseph to the canon, the Roman canon or something like that. And that might be the only change you make in a hundred years to the liturgy. That is a proper way to look at this liturgy. It is not to say you can't change anything, but it is to say it should be done organically. What that means is that it rises up naturally from the census fidelium, the idea that the faith of the people, like for example, if a great devotion to St. Uh, uh, Joseph arises and increases, increases, and there's this call for we want a greater appreciation of him, then you could perhaps over time, he could be added to the canon. It's not a, the Pope thinks, oh, you know, it'd be a great idea if I kind of like uh, this idea, I'm going to kind of integrate that into the liturgy somehow. That's not the way it should be done. And so papalatry though would say, that's fine. Whatever the Pope says he can do and he should do. And I, I think that's a real danger that what were, who were formerly, and I, it's a danger that arose among both JP Catholic, JP two Catholics and liberal Catholics. And the liberal Catholics, it arose under Francis simply because he was saying what they wanted to hear. And so it's like, okay, great. Now he's infallible in everything he ever says, because I agree with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas JP two Catholics like myself, let's be honest, at least I know I did this during the JP two era, we creeped into that. We started to say, okay, the Pope says it, it's true. In fact, I was just listening, I won't name who it was, but it's a prominent Catholic person who I, I respect and admire to this day. I was listening to a talk by him from 1998 or 2000, something like that. And he mentioned something about, he's talking about encyclical with JP2. And he essentially says something to the effect of, well, J, you know, he, the Pope has basically declared this. And it was a question on Catholic philosophy that the Pope has no authority to, make a definitive statement like now we have to accept this it was just the pope giving his opinion about something and so all of us and i realized at the time he said that i know i would have embraced that as well as like the pope said it okay it's that's what we all have to believe now and so we created this monster so to speak and so but now it is a monster because we have a pope who who says many things that are they're contrary to, to traditional practices and therefore uh, should be resisted. But the idea is, well, the papalers say, no, you can't resist anything a Pope does whatsoever. I mean, they, they'll give you lip service to, oh yeah, he can sin. He's not impeccable. Not everything he says is infallible. But I've literally never seen most of these people actually criticize anything, like for example, Pope Francis ever said. So in effect, they're papalers. Yeah, you have a really great little article I'll link in the notes on 1 Peter 5 that you, you I think there's three different little historical snippets. You talk about like there's like some peasant and he's oh, yeah. doing his work and um, I don't even remember the other two examples, but you're just pointing out that most for most of Catholic history, our fathers didn't even know who the Pope's name, what the Pope's name was. Right. You know, uh, that usually that's the, that was the extent they might hear it. I mean, actually they wouldn't hear it because the, the, the canon, the, the prayers were said silently. He might know the name. Other mm -hmm. than that, he knew nothing. He prayed for him. 
he, he, he made sure, you know, he always included him in his prayers, but the average Catholic knew nothing about the Pope, nor did he care. He wasn't thinking, okay, what, what did the Pope say this morning over breakfast? And I need to make sure now that's what I embrace. And that's what I talk about to all my friends. That's what I evangelize about. It was a much more basic faith, which was a good thing. And another example I gave was the, uh, John the 22nd was Pope. It, he actually preached heresy. He preached the idea that when you died, you went into soul sleep, that you didn't, you weren't raised until the final judgment. And that's, that's heretical. At the time, it was not declared heretical, but it was declared literally the Pope after him declared it heretical. But he was preaching it and that was, that was erroneous. So he was, when I say preaching, I mean, he was just, you know, maybe his audiences at, at, in homilies, things like that, he was preaching it. Not declaring it had to be believed by all Catholics, but he was personally preaching it. And it was theologian at the University of Paris who actually said, uh, hold on, Holy Father, that's not, that's not Catholic doctrine. And praise be to God, he repented before he died and, and, and said, no, you know, the, the theologians are right. Well, the papalitors would have been very down on those theologians at the University of Paris and would have said, you're not, that's not right. The Pope is preaching this. He's even preaching on something theo theological. You have to accept it with this obedience of faith. You have to abide by it. But they didn't, thanks be to God. And I think that's, that, that's a good history lesson for us that tells us, okay, when the Pope declares something infallibly, as part of his magisterial office, declares uh, something on faith and morals to be accepted by the whole church, yes, it is infallible. But everything else, there's, there's levels, but everything else is not protected in that way. And so, yes, there's different levels between what he says over breakfast to a friend and what he writes in an apostolic exhortation. But ultimately, though, other than infallible statements, he can err. And that, that's, that's the reality. Yeah. And so I, this is, I think, in my opinion, one of the most central issues that needs to be faced because it seems to be so much of the root of the crisis and I, I see this arising more in the 19th century and as, as a matter of emergency where the popes are dealing with these revolutions and everything and they're, they're calling all men to obey them in, in sort of an emergency situation. Uh, but they happen to be these saintly popes as well. So they're, they're teaching and preaching and cyclocating all these great, you know, doctrines and whatnot. So, um, <clears throat> But there seems to be a, a strong uh, culture that arises out of that where just the, the whole Catholic faith is just revolving around the Pope. Do you see that as, as uh, sort of arising at that time? Absolutely. I, that? I, I would agree completely. In fact, what I would say is we had a run like no other organization had of good leaders in the sense of good popes. We had hundreds of years of popes that were solid they basically from, I mean, I don't know exactly how far back, but you're going back towards the time of Trent all the way through the 1960s. We essentially have popes that are doing their job. Some were better than others. You have your St. Pius X, and then you have some that, you know, maybe weren't quite as, uh, as saintly. And that has a psychological impact on Catholics. They, they come to believe, I can trust the Pope that he is always going to do the right thing. A Catholic in the Middle Ages would not have had that, especially during, like, say, the Avignon Papacy or the Great Western Schism. That's not their, their go-to attitude. They recognize that these are, these are fallible human men in this position. So that's the first thing. We have this building up. And like you said, because of just the political, uh, what was going on in politics in different countries at the time in the 19th century, there really was a centralization of all things to the person of the Pope in the Catholic church. And so in a sense, the, the big criticism is, is of Vatican II. I would argue that we need to also look very honestly at how Vatican I has been implemented. We talk about the implementation of Vatican II. I would say how Vatican I has been implemented. By that, what I mean is, for most Catholics, practicing JP2 type Catholics, the idea 
the assumption is that you have to be overly, I, I would say overly deferential to every single thing the Pope says because he's our Holy Father and he, because he's infallible and he's the head of the church and all of this, you have to basically just either go along with every thing he says and promote it, or at least be silent if he ever does anything that you might think is problematic. And frankly, what you probably should do, if you think something's problematic that he does, it's your fault and you need to rethink how your faith is. I mean, you get that, I get at least that accusation a lot that I reject something Pope Francis says because I just simply am not open to his charisms of preaching and things like that. And, I, and that's just false. It's like this idea that I want him to be wrong. I want the exact opposite. And so I do think that this rise after Vatican, before and, then, and after Vatican I, Cardinal Newman himself, St. Uh, John Henry Newman, he warned about this, the possibility of this. His worry of declaring the Pope infallible being able to be infallible back in one, his worry was it would turn into essentially papalatry. And I do think that's what's happened. And I think, and you see this, and, and this is where I'm going to part with many of my traditional Catholic brethren when they, they look at the, the early 20th century as the ideal of all Catholic uh, theology in, when it comes to how we view the Pope. And that's actually where the more radical ones that go SETI on us, they, 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 because you see these writings of popes and other people that basically say, you have to obey every single word the pope says, he can never be an heir, and you have to accept every single thing he says and does. I mean, those are the writings of many Catholics, Catholic theologians and popes in the early 20th century. And now we're seeing the fruit of what happens though when we have a pope that is problematic? And the, you know, any SETI, they can, the contest who's watching this right now is probably saying, "Yes, yeah, see, I told you." I mean, I, I, you know, that's what that's what I'm trying to say. There's a certain consistency to it. I mean, they have to go through so many hoops to get to that consistency, but at the same time, I get how they get there because you either have to say that perhaps that theology that developed was a bit extreme and had some problems that need to be corrected. And I think that's actually what Vatican II should have done. And I think and some people wanted it to do was to correct that over emphasis on the, on the Pope as the central figure of Catholicism of which everything revolves, not just doctrine, but every, all Catholic life revolves. But that's not, of course, not what happened. And so I, I think that is the uh, origins of a lot of our issues today where we just don't know how to handle a Pope who maybe doesn't do a good job at being Pope. And, and we, that's why we have all these fights with, be, between Catholics. And, it's, and, and the truth is, I'm sympathetic to other people who struggle with how to deal with this because it is, it is a difficult question that the theologians need to hopefully eventually really concisely define what the role of the Pope really is in the, in the life of the church. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where and where, do you know where uh, Newman said those things? Where he was considering? You remember? I, I I've it quoted is, it. I've, I've quoted it before. We'll and have so to I'm look sure. that up. I, I have to look that up. But he basically was a letter or something like that, where he was essentially saying his concern was that it would it would exalt the Pope to a level beyond what is appropriate. Not because the words of the Vatican I Council did that, but because that would be the result. Because Newman understood how the human brain works, how the psyche works and all that. And I think he saw very clearly that that could be a, 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 an issue. That's why he opposed the definition ahead of time, beforehand. But of course, as a good cardinal, once it was defined validly by a council, he accepted it. Didn't mean he didn't have issues with how it could be interpreted and how it implemented. Yeah, and that and that also kind of goes into the fact that, you know, if we have issues with Vatican One, it's okay to have issues with Vatican Two, and just sort of right. point out that there's there's better ways to explain it, and or certain safeguards that we can put in place to sort of implement that. Um, I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon, but I wanted to ask you about one thing, and that is what's known as the biological solution, which is the idea that. Um, 
well, we can see that all these sort of liberal parishes kind of emptying out, uh, the liberal priesthoods kind of emptying out, uh, the new generation of young priests, they're very traditional, at least if they're not JP2 and they're trad priests. Um, so, and besides that, all the Orthodox Catholics are the ones who are not contracepting, so they're having all the children. So eventually, 50 years from now, the biological solution will just have worked this out so that the church has now been purified. Um, what do you think about that? Is that plausible? I I think it is plausible. I would. I look at it a little bit differently. I think all those things you said are true. I look at it a little bit differently in that I, I liken it to the, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was the, the, one of the two most powerful nations in the world. In the 1970s, it looked like it would be here for a very long time. And what happened? It collapsed almost overnight in the late 80s. And I would say it's because it was built upon lies. It was built upon falsehoods. And anything built upon falsehoods eventually collapses on the weight of it, on an undertone weight of falsehood. And I would argue, I'm not going to, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that like the Catholic Church has been built on lies like the Soviet Union. But the truth is that how the implementation, the council, however you want to say it, how the council has been implemented in the church, how it's been lived out, is built upon a, a number of falsehoods about the human person. For example, how we are to worship God, how we are to, uh, wor- how, how we are to look upon our fellow man, how we are to look upon human sexuality, all that stuff. And so eventually it collapses within, on, on top of itself. And so I don't think it can last forever. And I do think all the practical things you said are, are true in that we're having more kids. The young, pe- young people are rejecting the, 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 the new mass, which of course is now the old mass to them practically. And so I think all those things will happen. I personally think though it will be similar to what happened in the Soviet Union, where in the, even in the early mid eighties, nobody would have guessed that it would be collapsed within five to 10 years. And I think like something like a black swan event, something happens like McCarrick event is a great example where all of a sudden it became cool to be a traditional Catholic. Whereas literally weeks before the whole McCarrick thing broke, it was still pretty common. And I know it's still common in some circles, but the traditionalists were looked upon as this little minority sect that was weird and eccentric and all that. And within six months, Whereas it, it was still not the mainstream, now all of a sudden, a lot of people who before looked at the traditional eccentric said, you know, maybe we should give that a try. And so I don't know if that's going to happen in 25 years, 50 years, 100 years. But I do know that novus ordinatism, whatever you want to call it, the, the new way of doing things, it, it cannot survive it will go the same way as these mainline Protestant denominations have gone. I mean, the, the Episcopal church is dying quickly and most of the Vatican II church is trying to be like the Episcopal church. So it will eventually die out. And what will be left, it, by the way, this is all a sad thing. This is not something to rejoice over, but I personally think what will happen is the church will get much, much, much smaller. But the people who will be left will realize, okay, we need to, the, the, the majority will be traditions because we'll be the only ones left. Yeah. I, I, and I think that's a big thing. I, I, what happened with McCarrick was that I always, I always thought the biological solution would just, well, no problem 50 years from now. And it does seem like the, the, the generation, you know, 30, 40 years removed from Vatican two just doesn't have that same enthusiasm for Vatican II and the excitement in the springtime and all that, you know, it's kind of died away and there's not really, uh, hasn't, hasn't really been passed very well to the next generation. Um, but why, what I sort of thought during McCarrick was the fact that the, the hot, the culture itself is based on the sins of the flesh and it's based on, just pornography and advertising and all psychological manipulation and all sorts of things like that. And as long as the next generation has original sin, they're still going to be tempted by the same culture and they're still going to be tempted by 
the sins of the flesh to conform the church to that. And so um, it's the biological solution doesn't, it's uh, it has its own challenges. Um, so, but that just, brings, yeah. go, ahead, I go just, ahead. I just don't think they'll care about the church is my, my point is that each generation has a weaker attachment to the church. You saw that because the boomers, they were given a very strong attachment to the church from their parents. And so they didn't leave. They wanted to change the church, but then their, their kids, a lot, a lot of them were like, ah, I guess I'll go, but I'll, I'll, I reject most teachers and a lot of them stop, stop going. Well, then their kids are like, what is even the point? Because the boomer Catholicism does not pass itself on. It does not, it does not procreate spiritually or physically. And so I think what happens is they simply just stop going and they don't care anymore. They're not going to care about changing the church. Eventually they're just going to want to persecute it. And that's a bad thing, but it also means that the people left we should always pray that we would have the strength to be, be, be left, not assume that we will be. The people left will be like, well, if we're going to get persecuted for this. We might as well do it, be all in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. What the heck? So, so let, me, let me close with this then. Uh, give us, you're, you're a father of six, seven? Seven. Is, seven, and you've got, um, I, if I recall from Marshall, you're, you've got one in college, right? I have two. I have one who's graduated from college and okay. two that are currently in college. Okay, great. So, so um, give us uh, three to five principles of keeping our children in the faith. How do we keep pass this down to them? Them growing up in this dark world. How do you keep them uh, in the faith? A couple things. First one is I, I am no expert and I just, I do my best and I, I struggle like everybody else to be a good parent. And I, I succeed sometimes and I fail often, unfortunately as well. I think that the number, the, the top principles are number one is you practice your own faith and you let it be part of your whole life. And so that means you don't, you, you pray in front of your kids you talk about the faith in front of your kids. You, you teach the faith to your kids. It's just part of your family life. So, for example, you do things like on your kid's patron uh, saint's day, you do something for your kid on that day. Those little things that make your, your family very Catholic, that it's a normal thing. It's not something, it's not an add-on to your life, but it's essential. The second bit of advice is actually sounds like the opposite. You live a normal and healthy, regular life as well. I do think there is the danger among practicing Catholics that you're so concerned that your kids don't fall away that you prevent them from living just a regular life of maybe following sports or being involved on the, 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 the local ballerina group or gymnastics, whatever the case may be, whatever it is their interests are. You can't just keep them completely out of the world. Obviously, you have to protect them. It's all age appropriate. You wouldn't do something with a six-year-old that you might with a 16-year-old, all of that. But, you all, but, but what that does is it gives them, I think, a healthy, uh, a healthy childhood where the faith is an integral part of everything, but yet at the same time, they're, they're, they're learning the human virtues as well. They're learning how to interact with the world and things like that. And then you pray like crazy uh, for them, pray all the time for them, and you love them to death. I mean, really, you, you just, I really believe, and I, I know every parent loves their kid, but you really show them that, that love, that you would, do, you would die for them, you would do any for, anything for them, because I think then when they go off on their own, they know there's an anchor they can go back to if things get troubled, that they always know I can go back to my, my, my parents. In fact, I always, uh, my, when my kids leave for college, they've all gone to college away from home. I tell each one of them before they leave, I say, I just, I want you to be very clear to you that you always can come back here. And if anything happens in your life, I don't care what you do. You always have a home here. We will support you. We will do everything we can to help you because I want them to know that they, they just, they know that there's that anchor there. And, and I think hopefully that's a good example of the father, God, the father and the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son. And so they just, those things I think you do. 
and just, you know, pray and hope for the best because we're all guessing on how to do it. <laughs> I mean, we're doing our best. And I think, uh, and every family's different on how they do it. There's no one set way, but I think those are kind of the principles, at least that I'm trying. I'm very you know, proud of my kids. They're great. They're awesome. Uh, I love them to death and, you know, but they're, they're in the world and they have the same temptations and free will that the rest of us have. And so I, I continue to pray for them. And what do you say to parents who have children who have gone astray? This was very common because I, I got this question a lot when I was director of evangelization at a diocese because there's a lot. It was in Florida where a lot of retirees were. People came to me all the time and said, my son has fallen away from the faith. He's not living a Catholic life. And I, I always just say that the number one job of actually a parent at that point, I'm assuming the, the child's an adult and has left the faith, is prayer and fasting. And I do believe both of those because I do believe prayer alone is effective, but prayer added on with penance is kind of supercharging your prayer. So I think penance is not fasting. I, I want to make sure everybody knows, talk to your doctor if you have medical issues, stuff like that. But the point is, Physical penance, I do believe, is very necessary. I think that's something you should do for your kids. The, the, the tough reality is you might, you probably are not going to be the one who brings them back directly in the sense that it's not going to be talking to you. He or she already knows what you believe. He or she already knows why, that you want them to, that, that, that you want them to convert, all that. And so the reason your, your primary job now is prayer and fasting is so that somebody might come into their life who's a Catholic who can bring them back into the church. It probably won't be your job because what I see is parents who get so upset that every single time they talk to their kid, they're bombarding them with, you got to come back to the church, you got to come back to church, all that stuff, which I mean, I understand the reason you do it, but it ain't helping. And so instead it needs to be, uh, your primary job is prayer and fasting for them. And there will be opportunities. There might be times where you might, where you can do things, you can say things, not that you never say something, but I do think you take a more passive role once your kid leaves because your job no longer is to parent them directly. Your job now is more as an advisor and as somebody who, but an advisor usually only gives advice when they're asked. So, and, and to pray for them. That's great. That's, I love this. That's very good advice. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, Everybody do yourself a favor and follow Eric on Twitter. He's at Eric R. Uh, Salmons. Yes, Eric, Eric R. Salmons. Eric R. What's the R for? Russell. Russell. All right. Yeah. So Eric family name. R. Salmons. That's Eric with a C, no K. Uh, and your website is ericsalmons.com, right? Correct. Excellent. So everybody check out Eric. And when's the book coming up? Oh, I don't know. I, it's, it's, I have to turn into publisher by the end of this year. Okay. And so my guess is early 2021 and I, I will meet my deadlines. I know a lot of authors, they get deadlines and they push them back, but I, I will meet my deadline. I'm, I'm saying it here on, All right, cool. <laughs> on the air, so holding myself to it. So Excellent. All right, Eric. Well, let's, let's pray for uh, the Salmon's family and for all the Catholic next generation and especially for all wayward Catholics and um, that they may come back to the faith. So name of the father, the son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.